Thank you. Who is that person? Wow. Is anyone interested in relationships? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How many of you are in one? How many of you want to be in one? How many of you want to be out of one? No, don't raise your hand. Okay, the ins and the outs look at each other. Well, actually, it's, it's uh, just a, a thrill to, to spend some time with you. I, I love being in front of students uh, in my current uh, role at AACC. Um, you know, it's not in the uh, academic setting as much, and so I always enjoy uh, being around and sharing with those uh, who are just hungry to learn. And uh, one of the things I want to just encourage you is to uh, commit yourself to be a lifelong learner, no matter what, okay? Uh, that, that's just the teacher of me coming out a little bit. But uh, we're talking about some uh, uh, an important topic uh, because relationships, uh, anyone in here already married, just out of curiosity, a few married? How many want to be married or plan to be married sometime in your lifetime? Okay. My wife and I just celebrated uh, anniversary number 30 last year, so um, I feel like that's a pretty good milestone. You know, before we talked about it, I'm going to share maybe about a half an hour and then we'll do some Q&A or so. I want to be respectful for your time. Uh, but I thought you might like to hear what kids have to say about dating and marriage. You know, the scripture says that a child shall lead them. And so let's be led by a child for a minute. So these questions were posed to real kids. And uh, I'll give you the question and I'll give you some of their responses. How do you decide who to marry? Alan, age nine, said, well, you've got to find somebody who likes the same stuff. Like, if you like sports, she should like it that you like sports. <laughs> and she should keep the chips and dip coming. <laughs> Alan will be one of my clients in the future. <laughs> Kristen, age eight, says, well, no person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God does all that way before, and you get to find out later who you're stuck with. <laughs> How can a stranger tell if two people are married? Derek, age eight. Well, you might have to guess based on whether or not they seem to be yelling at the same kids. <laughs> What do most people do on a date? Lynette, age seven. Dates are for having fun, and people should use them to get to know each other. Even boys have something to say if you let them talk long enough. <laughs> what would you do on a first date that was turning sour? And I'm thinking I might tell you about my first date with my wife. Would you like to hear that story? It took me three years of therapy to work through it, but I'm going to share because I'm now in recovery. So what would you do on a first date that was turning sour? Craig, age nine, said, I'd run home and play dead. The next day I would call all the newspapers and make sure they wrote about me in all the dead columns. I know this is an important one. We're at a Christian university. When is it okay to kiss someone? Big theological question, right? Well, Pam, age seven, has it right here, when they're rich. <laughs> now you don't have to wonder. Kathy, age nine, says, never kiss in front of other people. It's a big embarrassing thing if anyone sees you, and if nobody sees you, I might be willing to try it with a handsome boy just for a few hours, though. <laughs> the rule goes like this. This is Howard, age eight. If you kiss someone, then you should marry them and have kids with them. It's just the right thing to do. <laughs> a couple more. How would the world be different if people didn't get married? Kelvin, age eight, said, there sure would be a lot of kids to explain, now wouldn't there? <laughs> and then lastly, how would you make your marriage work? Ricky, age nine, tell your wife she looks pretty, even if she looks like a truck. Oh. 
Do you like that? Um, some of what I'm going to share about, and maybe I'll give these to uh, Dr. Garzano, but uh, I understand that uh, uh, some of this will be posted on the uh, Facebook, uh, is the AACC Facebook page? Or? American Association of Christian Counselors at Liberty. Okay, Facebook, and uh, if anyone actually wanted it, it's in a little uh, PDF file, and I, you could talk to one of the uh, AACC team members, and I'm sure they'd be happy to get it from uh, uh, Dr. Garzon or the, the ACC group. Um, every, let me, let me, the guys, look at me for a minute. There's only three things that every man needs to know about a woman, okay? I see people getting their pens and pencils out. There's only three things every guy needs to know about a woman, and no one knows what they are. So. So let's talk about finding true love about finding meaningful relationship and, you know, especially in choosing a, a marriage partner. Um, do you think that there is a biblical mandate? Is there a biblical mandate about marriage and about the permanency of relationship? I think so. And the question often is posed, you know, are you equally what? What's the word? Yes. Equally yoked. And it comes out of the scripture in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15. It says, don't be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship is light or darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? And what is a believer in common with an unbeliever? I've actually seen, because I've done quite a bit of premarital counseling. And I, I've actually seen people take and use that scripture to talk about whether they're yoked or unyoked in a lot of different ways. Are we yoked or unyoked in terms of our culture, our ethnicity, um, our family backgrounds, our education levels? Well, while I think those are good things to think about and consider and talk about uh, for any couple considering a relationship, I think it's taking that scripture a little bit out of context because if you look at it, what it's talking about is really only in terms of should you really get into a relationship with someone who is not at the same place with you in terms of your having a relationship with Christ? But beyond that, I don't know if there's always just an absolute uh, perfect person. I think there is a there are wise choices and there are certainly unwise choices, and we'll talk about that. Um, I believe that God does have a, a, a will for our lives. And um, I also don't believe he's the kind of God that hides his will from us. I really don't. And so I think part of it is about seeking him and about seeking him together. So what factors do you think influence whether or not people marry or remain single? You know, it wasn't that long ago that the average age that people would uh, find relationship and get married in this country was about 18 to 21. All right? A hundred years ago, that was the average age. What do you think it is today? Anyone know? It's about 27 for men and about 26 for women. And so what's happening is people are delaying getting married. Some are choosing to live together. And uh, about 10% uh, of all people who get married cohabitated before getting married. And sometimes the question is, is do you do the try before you buy philosophy? How does that work out? What does the research say about whether or not you live with someone before you get married? 20, 25 years ago, it made a difference. 20, 25 years ago, there was more of a stigma attached to a couple living together but not being married. And so naturally, they actually increased the amount of tension and stress in the relationship that they had to deal with sort of a public perception as well as just the reality of being in relationship with anybody. Today, that stigma is not the same as it was. Why? Why do you think so? Well, I believe we live in a postmodern, and I'm not sure an entirely Christian culture anymore. And if you think about how media portrays relationships, and how media portrays love, or the context of love, and the reality that sex sells everything today, then the stigmatization of whether or not couples hook up or cohabitate is not what it was 20, 25 years ago, and so you see a little bit more of it. However, um, and I was sharing this in the short little interview we did before um, um, 
as the, the time started tonight, is that couples who, who do those things often struggle when it comes down to the relationship being tested. Because when the relationship is tested, it's so easy to walk away from it. And I can promise you a great sex life will not keep any relationship together in and of itself. It doesn't hurt, but it's not necessarily the glue of relationship. Um, so what factors influence the choice to marry or remain single? And let, let me say this to, to you all. In my opinion, one is a whole number. I think it's as much to say that God calls someone to be single as he calls, calls someone to marry. And so if, if uh, someone uh, feels led not to get married to pursue that level of a relationship or isn't, there's no, it's no guilt. I would say shame off you. <laughs> Every time we pray, remember, we're praying to someone who lived his life as a single adult. Okay? But why do some people wait these days? What are some of the factors that you all contend with that some generation ago was not as much of a factor? Some things like job and career goals. Uh, with more and more women uh, entering into uh, career tracks and in, in uh, higher education, well, that is postponing marriage for uh, some couples. Waiting for the perfect mate. Compatibility and values. Um, some are afraid of divorce. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because for some it might still be a, a painful experience. But the research would say that maybe half of us in this room came out of a either divorced or a blended family growing up. The divorce rate in the United States has increased every decade since 1860. It has dropped off a little bit over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, but it's still one of the highest divorce rates among any Western civilization, any culture. So what happens is some people go, gosh, I know what I lived with and grew up with. I'm not so sure, I, and I see the pain that it caused, and I get concerned, I'm afraid, I just don't want to walk down that personally, or I'd never want to walk down that down with my own um, kids, so, so I wait. And then some pop people actually recognize that there's possibly a need for more maturity and growing up and life experience. Um, so why do some choose wisely and unwisely? Let me share with you what I've seen in some of the marriage counseling that I've done. I've been counseling couples for close to 30 years now. Um, some of the choices and the dynamics that impact that, codependency. I don't know how many times I've talked to people and they find somebody to fix. Don't find people to fix. Why do we recreate the dynamics we grew up with? How many of you here are like psychology or counseling students? A lot of you studying that? All right, I don't know if you studied this before, but we all have the tendency to recreate our family of origin in our adult relationships. Let me say that again. We all have the tendency to recreate our family of origin in our adult relationships, especially if there was pain or problems. Why? We just got through the holidays, right? You're with family. You know, things like um, uh, addiction, drinking, suicide rates, depression, all increases between about early November to mid-January. Why? What's going on in those two, two to three months? It's the holidays, and people are used to thinking I'm with family, but if you have unresolved family things, what happens is we reset the scene, we insert people into the scene, a dad that didn't love me, someone who was abusive, or whatever, someone I could never please. We set the scene, we roll the tape, we insert ourselves into the scene, and this time we're hoping for a happier ending. 